about it. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for the possibility to present our paper here. Uh, as, as you probably saw, the um, title of the talk slightly changed, but you will still get the same content, so, so don't worry about that. Uh, I shall start with giving a brief introduction what to expect here in the next roughly 30 minutes. And I want to start with the Bayesian brain hypothesis, which basically says that the human brain generates predictions basically just in the same way as an ideal Bayesian agent. Right, so we have a couple of hypotheses we might uh, be interested in, we might want to reason about, we assign uh, prior probabilities, and then uh, through our senses and so on, new evidence comes in, and basically we update our probabilities just according to, to Bayes' theory, and that's the idea. And of course, there are many questions uh, and problems connected with that hypothesis, and many pieces of the puzzle, so to say. But here in this talk, that's um, quite uh, modest, I guess, we focus on a very specific piece of the puzzle, namely how we could understand analogical inference um, to the background uh, of, of, of a Bayesian approach. So that's that's a research question here. So uh, why analogical inference? Well, um, that becomes interesting whenever we are interested uh, in, in a hypothesis about um, something, but we cannot collect direct evidence for that hypothesis. Okay, There might be different reasons for why we cannot access direct evidence, um, for example, theoretical reasons. There might also be practical reasons. Maybe we just don't have the proper um, devices to collect the evidence, or they are too expensive or something like that. And there might, of course, also be moral reasons. Anyway, whenever we face such a situation, uh, it can be in everyday life, but also in scientific contexts, then um, we can try to investigate a just similarly enough so-called analog system instead of the target system. Okay, uh, I, I just follow the standard in the literature here. So the system we want to ultimately find something out about, uh, we will call the target system. And the system we actually study, we will call the source system. Okay. And then we try uh, to get some evidence about the source system, and we try to use it to confirm the hypothesis about the target system. That's the idea. Uh, here we brought you a specific example uh, for illustration. Assume we're interested in a new antiviral compound, and we want to know how it works on humans. Then um, this time for moral reasons, normally we don't start uh, right with a study on humans because that's not safe enough in the beginning, but we try um, to study our antiviral compound first on a suitable model organism, such as rats, for example. Then we do our rat study. Here, so that's our source system. And we try to infer based on the results from the rat study, something about the effectiveness of the antiviral compound on humans. That's the target system, okay? So um, what's the problem here? Well, the problem of course is how exactly does this kind of confirmation uh, work to the background of uh, roughly Bayesian account. Um, there's already some work out there, uh, and we focus on the Dashti and Oil's uh, recent nice paper, and they basically propose a Bayesian model for analogical inference, but not in general, they propose it for a very specific case uh, that's, that has to do with Hawking radiation. Here in the talk, however, we are interested in how, how well the model would work as a general model for analogical inference to, to cover basically all kinds of analogical inference we, we might encounter. Uh, what they are doing in the paper is that they formulate a couple of constraints such that if these constraints are satisfied, then basically, basically analogical inference just reduces to ordinary Bayesian updating. Okay, so that's the project. And that's where, where we want to connect with this talk. <clears throat> in particular, um, we want to point at uh, some problems with their approach uh, if we understand it as a general account of onological inference. Then we will uh, think about how we can overcome these problems via modifying um, their Bayesian model in certain ways. And uh, in the end, um, we will talk about uh, the two different models for analogical inference, the different applications and the different types of analogical inference they can cover or the different epistemic situations they might help us to, to model. So here's a brief roadmap. In the next part, I will um, introduce you briefly to the Dash et al. model and to the problems I mentioned before, then our alternative model, which can overcome these problems. And then Barbara will uh, compare the two models and tell you a little bit more about the different uh, contexts where each of the models can, sh can shine. And then we wrap up. So first part is already over. Let's come to the next part. 
Uh, first, let me introduce uh, a few variables. So we have small s here that will stand for the source system. That will be the immune system of rats in our example. And we have small t here, which will stand for the target system. That's the immune system of humans. Then we need two binary variables for the hypothesis. HS is the hypothesis about the rat system. So it could simply say, well, the antiviral compound is effective without severe side effects if for rats. And HT would make the same claim, but for humans. And then we could have pieces of evidence, ES for the source system and ET for the um, target system, the, the human system. And here in the picture, you basically see a kind of illustration how this type of inference would work based on these variables. Um, the problem is, of course, that we cannot access uh, ET directly here in the beginning for practical and moral reasons, as mentioned before. So we don't have uh, that accessible in the beginning. But what we have is here the evidence about the, the red system. And the task now is um, to answer the question, how can we utilize, how can we use this evidence in order to confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis about the target system. And of course, the, the core uh, um, crucial part of the answer consists in, we need to establish a kind of shared structure between the two systems, okay? And that does the trick and makes the inference running. And another question is, how, how, how do the details look from, from a Bayesian perspective? So here's uh, the Dash et al's model. They introduce one further variable you see here on the right side, that's this X variable. And uh, in a kind of generalized approach of, of what they um, suggest, X can just stand for um, the structural similarities, okay? And then they make a couple of assumptions. The first one here is that the probability of distribution over X is not extreme. That seems plausible because if it would be extreme, right, so one or zero, then we could not update the similarity hypothesis between the two systems. And that's something we want to avoid in research contexts. So we always want uh, to leave some, some room for error, right? The second assumption says that if the two systems actually uh, share relevant structural similarities, then each of the two hypotheses uh, should be expected to be more probable. And the third condition just says that ES is positive evidence for HS. So that's a quite harmless one. And um, one of the core assumptions is, of course, that this Bayesian network here correctly represents the structure of this type of inference. Okay. And now one of the main achievements in their paper is that they show, well, if all of these four um, assumptions here are in place, then basically we get this result, okay? Whenever we observe the evidence ES about the source system, the probability for the hypothesis of the target system goes up and we have some confirmatory impact, okay? So analogical inference under these assumptions just uh, reduces to, to patient uptake. That's the idea. So let's talk about uh, first a minor problem with their approach. And that comes with the second um, assumption you see here on the slide again. The assumption says that, um, again, uh, if the two systems uh, share relevant structural similarities, then um, each one of the hypotheses can be expected to be more likely to be true, okay? And, and now you might wonder, well, why should that be the case? Why should similarity between the source and the target system make the hypothesis more probable? Right. So intuitively, it seems that similarity just should make both hypotheses more likely to be true or false together. Okay. But it should not discriminate between truth or, or, or falsehood between the hypotheses. That's that, that's why we're doing the red study in the first place. Okay. We want to know whether the hypotheses are more likely to be true or false. Um, that's that's not really a large problem. It's it can easily be fixed. We can replace um two by two star here which then just, just expresses the intuition just mentioned, right? To start just says, well, if um, the systems are indeed structurally similar, then both hypotheses are either more likely to be true together or more likely to be false together, okay? And if we kick out the original condition two and add the new assumption to start, then we can still prove um, the nice result from the Dash did alls paper. And we still get the analogical inference um, running. So let's come to the bit more severe problems now, but, but keep this intuition in mind I just mentioned, right? The structural similarity should make the hypothesis more to be true or false together, because that will play a, a major role later on again. So uh, to, to show you the more severe problems, we need to talk about the degree of similarity between the two systems. 
Um, and to, to that end, uh, let's have a look at X again. So X, right, taking value of one, X being true, stands for perfect similarity between the two systems. And non-X stands basically for no similarity at all. So these are the two extremes. And now the idea is that we can measure or represent the degree of similarity between the source and the target system just via adding and building a reliability model around X. So that's in a nutshell how it looks like. We introduced two new variables, EX here, which stands for new and independent evidence for the structural similarity hypothesis X. And RX here is a so-called reliability node, which uh, gives us information about how reliable the source that provides us with evidence EX is, or the, the uh, agent the scientist thinks how reliable it is, okay? And then we specify um, the conditional probabilities of EX given um, its parents, like in the table here, you see on the slide. And basically the idea is if the source is perfectly reliable, okay, and the similarity hypothesis X is true, then we would also find the corresponding evidence EX. If on the other hand, the similarity hypothesis X is false, then we would find the counter evidence non-EX, okay? And if the source uh, is perfectly unreliable, then uh, the probability for finding E would just be the same regardless of whether X is true or false. So we just get this A, which is just any positive probability value, okay? So um, what, what can we do with that now? But the idea is to combine it with the original Dashed et al model. And uh, now we can connect the confirmatory impact of ES on HD, that's what we are interested, and the degree of similarity between the source and the target system uh, via just having a look at here um, the confirmatory impact of ES on H HT, conditional on the evidence about the similarity EX, okay? So we are conditionalizing here on this evidence. We have some evidence for the structural similarity. And then we are looking at the degree of confirmation ES provides for HT. And the interesting thing is now that we can vary the probability distribution over Rx, okay? So we can increase it, we can decrease it. And the idea is that that reflects the degree of similarity the agent assigns to, to the two systems, okay? So we can explore all the possibilities and all the different uh, similarities here. That's the plan. Okay, uh, so let's do that. Then we can make a couple of, um, we think, problematic observations, at least for some cases and uh, some applications of the approach that are problematic. For example, the red case study here. So the first thing we can observe is that um, if we are not considering any evidence for the structural similarity, we are not conditionalizing on EX at all, then we will find that ES is still informative with respect to HT, okay? Um, and, and that might, might be a bit counterintuitive because typically in analogical inference, uh, to get the inference running, we need to have some good reasons to assume the structural similarity, right? We need some evidence uh, for the structural similarity before we can make an analogical inference. That's the first problem. The second one is if we assign a full similarity, right? So this means um, we set the probability distribution over Rx uh, to one here, okay? Then we will get the result that um, ES and HT are screened off each other which means that if we have, uh, if the red immune system would be perfectly similar to the human immune system, then uh, by observing evidence about the rats, we could make no inference at all about what would happen in the human immune system, okay? That also stands in contrast to some basic intuitions, we would say. And related to that is the last observation. So there are actually cases where uh, we increase this magnitude here, right? Which uh, represents the degree of similarity. So uh, there are cases where the degree of similarity between the system goes up, but the confirmatory impact of the evidence from the source system for the hypothesis about the target system goes down. And, and that also seems counterintuitive, at, at least in our uh, exemplary case here again. Because if, if, if you look what's happening, then, then, then you see that our researchers are actually um, uh, breeding strands of rats in order to make their immune system as closely uh, as similar as possible to the human immune system. And that would, would make this more or less future. Okay, so these are the three problems here. Uh, here you can see the, for the last point, how the curve might look like. So for this probability distribution you see here at the bottom of the page, when you increase on the x-axis the degree of similarity, 
then you can see what happens with the um, confirmatory impact. So it goes up and up and up, up to 0.5 and a little bit further. And at some point, then it drastically falls down and hits zero by if, if, if we reach perfect similarity. Okay, um, what can we do about it? So uh, the idea is basically we change the structure of the network. So uh, we flip those two arrows before X uh, was a common parent of HS and HT. And now we just flip the two arrows. Okay, now we have this collider structure here. <clears throat> Uh, we follow uh, the dash t at all, and um, we assume that the probability distributions over our new exogenous variables are not extreme for the same reasons stated it. And we still assume that ES is positive evidence for HS. So this assumption is basically just mirror what uh, the dash t at all assumed. And um, of course, we change the network structure in the way just described. And then we need uh, more uh, one more assumption that gives us a bit more information about how this new um, analogical mechanism here works. So this, this part of the structure, this collider substructure here. Uh, I, I, I try just to, to tell you in words what's the motivation between this um, assumption here. The idea is again, if the two systems are indeed structurally similar in relevant ways, then um, the two hypotheses should be more likely to be true or false together, okay, than one being true and the other being false. That's why we have <clears throat> These two conditional probabilities here on the left-hand side of the inequality sign, and those two with HS, non-HT, non-HS, HT on the right-hand side. And uh, the second observation is if there's a structural similarity, right, between the two systems, then it should not discriminate between truth or false, falsehood of the hypothesis. That's why we have the equality signs here and here, okay? Okay. Uh, that's a picture of uh, the original Dadashti et al. model again, and the three problematic observations we made. Let's replace it now with our modified model and look what happens with the problematic observations. So the first thing um, we can see is even if we are not conditionalizing on uh, independent evidence for the similarity uh, assumption, it's, it's now the case that ES is actually not informative with respect to HT, and that's exactly what we wanted to get. Uh, second, um, if uh, we look at the case where we have perfect similarity between the two systems, then now it turns out that the source, uh, the evidence about the source system is actually maximally informative with respect to, uh, to the hypothesis about the target system, which is also what we wanted. And uh, finally, the um, changes in the um, degree of similarity between the two systems and the conformatory impact of ES on HT actually always go hand in hand. They increase together and they decrease together. That's, that's, that's basically what we wanted um, for, the, for the third point. Okay, so that's the alternative model. And now I stop sharing and Barbara will uh, tell you about which model to use in which situation. Okay, so now I would try to compare the two models regarding two kinds of analogy. Of analogical reasoning that we found uh, interestingly associated with these uh, two models. And uh, it would be interesting to have uh, your, your feedback on our ideas on that. Uh, so the idea is that beyond the mathematical results that we found, are there any epistemic reasons for preferring one model to the other? Is there any diversity in the inferential paths underpinning different sorts of analogical reasoning that would justify one model rather than the other? Uh, why should the variable X, standing for the similarity hypothesis, uh, be modeled as a common origin in one case or a collider in another? I'm just putting here these questions for you to think about it. And then uh, also we know that the probability in these two models, of course, uh, and therefore information is propagated differently. And this may reflect the epistemic inputs and outputs in the two diverse epistemic contexts. We suggest that the common origin model is more suited to formalize confirmation by analogy, whereas the collider model best represents extrapolation by analogy. So here, uh, Alice came up with this uh, very interesting, nice toy model. Uh, let's suppose that we have two hypotheses, uh, lodestone attracts iron or electromagnets attract iron, and two distinct ways of conceiving this similarity between the two source, uh, the two systems, the source and the target. The theory X1 is the theory of electromagnetism applies to electromagnets and low stone. So it covers both uh, systems. X2 is rather 
electromagnets and lodestone behave analogously when it comes to attracting iron. So uh, with regard, respect to a specific uh, phenomenon. And as you can see here, we put together again the two, the two systems and two models. The main difference uh, regard whether an ES, so evidence about source system is informative for HD, whether or not we take EX into account and uh, whether uh, ES is maximally informative for HT if uh, we condition on X, let's say. So if X is perfectly, uh, if X is perfectly similar and also vice versa. And uh, uh, whether the, uh, let's say, the confirmatory support of uh, the evidence about the source system increases uh, uh, hand in hand with the increase of the structural similarity as represented by the increase of the reliability of the evidence about the structural similarity. So let's uh, see this uh, in the two uh, in the two target in the two target models in the sense in the two types of uh, analogy confirmatory uh, via confirmation via theoretical analogy and extrapolation by analogy. Let's start with confirmation by analogy. So in the common origin model, once we condition X, this is, we know whether the structural similarity holds perfectly or not at all, then any evidence from one system becomes completely irrelevant to the other. This is exemplified by theoretical analogy, where the similarity is stipulated by assumption, let's say by fiat, and the research question is focused on whether the structural relations attributed to the target by the model are sufficient to predict reproduce its behavior. Let's think about theoretical physics. Uh, for instance, the example that uh, was studied by Dardashti and colleagues. So the screening off of the two hypotheses by the same hypothesis of similarity makes sense. If it turns out that Px is Px1 is false, then so sorry, x1 is false, then so Px1 is zero, then uh, end of the story. Uh, it, given that the two systems are not covered by the same uh, theoretical laws, then nothing that we learn from one system can teach us anything about the other. If we get to know with certainty that the theory applies to both systems, then we already know everything we need to know. And, and so nothing, I mean, all the evidence that we have about one system is redundant, irrelevant to the other system. And that, so the common origin model reflects this uh, fairly well. Also, the marginal decrease in confirmatory boost with decreasing the probability of X1 makes sense here. The closer we come to knowing that both pistons are covered by the same theoretical laws, the less we can marginally learn about one by doing experiments on the other. Instead, and here we come to the other uh, kind of analogy, uh, the kind of proposition exemplified by X2 doesn't provide us with covering theoretical laws applying to both systems. It more modestly states that the two systems behave similarly with respect to some of their subparts, specific uh, black box mechanisms, uh, such in the immune system, the antiviral compound being effective or safe for humans and for rats, and uh, extrapolated from rats to humans. Uh, this is in contrast to the focus of confirmation by analogy, whose uh, uh, scope covers the behavior of the two systems as wholes. In extrapolation by analogy, the more we know about the source and the target system, the more we learn about their similarity, and thereby the more the two become epistemically relevant to each other. So this explains the collider model. We, I know more about HS, I know more about HT, Therefore, I am more aware about the similarity and this in turn make them more dependent on each other and so epistemically relevant for each other. Once we are certain that the two systems behave similarly, the confirmatory boost of ES, so the evidence of the source system, is maximal for HD, the target system. And this is reflected in the collider model. Anyway, we need some empirical reasons for entertaining the hypothesis of similarity here, because it's not uh, a theoretical similarity constructed by fiat, such as in theoretical physics, a dumb hole system for black hole uh, radiation. Uh, it is, I mean, we presume based on uh, general theoretical laws on physiology, biology, genetics, that the rat is similar, rat immune system is similar to the human immune system, but it's rather an opaque similarity 
And this is re also reflected in the collateral model, which does not allow ES, so the evidence about the rat or the antiviral compound working in the rat to be directly relevant for HT if we don't have any evidence, any reasons for thinking that the two immune systems are similar. So we have to consider also EX, evidence about the similarity itself. This form a distinction of confirmation via theoretical analogy versus extrapolation by analogy nicely dovetails and vindicates Levis and Curie's uh, insistence on the distinct epistemic dynamics uh, underpinning theoretical modeling versus model organisms. And what is interesting is that uh, our model, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, provides a formal underpinning uh, to the solutions proposed to the extrapolation circle. What is the extrapolation circle? You might know. Uh, it is a phenomenon, uh, I mean, in, uh, in, uh, in economics, but also in medicine, uh, regarding uh, the extrapolation of evidence from the study setting to the uh, target setting. In order to apply evidence about causal effects observed in a study setting to another one, one needs to be confident enough that the latter is sufficiently similar in a causally relevant way to the former. In order to know that this assumption is met, one would need to have sufficient causal knowledge about the target setting, which would make extrapolation redundant. For instance, solutions advanced by Daniel Steele, Daniel Koshrovi, uh, make it that we need both partial knowledge about both systems, but we don't need perfect knowledge about um, both systems plus indirect evidence about their similarity. They don't formalize this stuff. Our formalization provides epistemic just justificatory underpinnings to such attempts. So by allowing a probabilistic assessment and update about the hypothesis of similarity itself, EX, our model does not require full knowledge of the relevant causal mechanisms to get extrapolation going. So we don't need to know perfectly that there are the two causally relevant uh, systems uh, uh, applying there. It shows how evidence about X, X and our degree of confidence in its reliability, so also Rx, may contribute to updating HT. This represents the confirmatory role of indirect evidence about the similarity itself advocated by defenders of extrapolation. Finally, reliance on a consolidated approach to modeling scientific inference, such as Bayesian epistemology, provides a possible robust way to uh, formalize such an extremely important, but also very elusive uh, inferential procedure, such as extrapolation. So we wrap up. We explore the Dashti model as a general model for analogical inference. Uh, we argue that one minor problem of the model can be overcome by a simple fix. Uh, this was exactly the uh, kind of uh, uh, fix made by two star. We pointed to limitations of the model once one takes the connection of degree of similarity and degree of com confirmation into account. We proposed an alternative model that can avoid these problems. And finally, we uh, compared the two models and argued that uh, they are better suited for different uh, contexts of, of analogy, uh, which is confirmation by analogy and ex uh, extrapolation by analogy. Thank you.